Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in chapter 5 with verse 13. If you don't have a Bible and you'd like one, you can grab one out of the pew and keep it for yourself. You can take it with you when you leave here today. If you're listening online and you watch, uh, if you live here in Abilene or close to Abilene, you can drop by our community uh, garden. It's located at South 19th and Emerald Street. Drop by there and grab a Bible out of our little library out there. If you live further out and you watch us regularly and would like a Bible, email us office at aldersgateabling.org. We'll be happy to mail you one. So we're looking at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. Listen to what Jesus says. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to go to the Lord in prayer with me. Father God, as we come to you this morning, there's a lot of other things in the world happening around us. We know there are wars and rumors of war. We know there is unsettled people. We know that there are bills that would need to be paid this week, groceries to be purchased, homework to be done. And yet this morning, we want to set all of that to the side. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit helps us to focus in on these words of Jesus Christ and allow those words to echo out across the ages and to settle in on us this morning. And that as those words settle on us, Father God, that we listen very carefully to what Jesus is saying, that we understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ what it means to be salt, and what it means to be light. So I pray that your Spirit will now take these words and transform us into the very image of Jesus. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So up until I was in about the sixth grade, I didn't pay much attention to words. For me, they were just simply a means to an end. They carried a cursory purpose for me. I used the spoken word to talk to people. My written word was hastily jotted down because I wanted to get through with that so I could go do something else. But you see, it was the written word in books. Those were my favorite words. Short stories and novels and history books, they were my very best friends whenever I was growing up. I could spend hours and hours of doing nothing more than simply reading a book. And so for me, these words, they they were the words on the page, and they brought to me the world beyond where I live. They brought to life a world of things I never would have seen otherwise. But you see, my love affair with words changed whenever I was in grade six, thanks to my history teacher that year. Her name was Ms. Twyla Albertson. Now, Ms. Albertson was a boisterous extrovert, not like me at all. And so to my young mind, she was the smartest person I had ever met. And so the curriculum of the history class that year was ancient history. And so we began at the very beginning of time with the Fertile Crescent. And that slowly gave way to ancient Egypt. And then we got into Greece. And then we finally made it to the great city, the eternal city of Rome. And my appreciation of words, it it changed one day as she was up there talking about the Roman Empire, the Roman military. Miss Albertson, she made this offhanded comment. She said, did y'all know that we get the modern day word salary from the word salt? And then she went ahead and explained it. She said that Roman soldiers were often paid in salt because of salt's high value in the ancient world. And that was the very first time that I realized that words, like people, they have ancestors. Words have a a family history. Now, as much as it pains me to say this this morning, Miss Albertson was actually wrong that day. At least she was partly wrong. 
You see, we do get the word salary from the word salt, but salt was not paid to the soldiers. Instead, the soldiers received a monetary stipend called a salary in order to buy salt because it was very expensive. It was a needed commodity, and they needed the salt. And so Jesus, he takes this word salt, this this needed commodity, this expensive commodity, and he begins to teach his disciples a little bit about it. He, He opens up today's reading with this metaphor about salt. Now, it would be very easy for us, church, to skip over these verses. We, we've heard them a lot before, haven't we? It would be very simple for us to give a perfunctory glance at what's taking place here and move on to what's in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. But you see, if we do that, that's a huge mistake. These four verses, these four verses, that they bridge the Beatitudes with the rest of the text after it. They become somewhat of a central text to what Jesus wants us to understand about who we are. In the Beatitudes, Jesus established the foundation of the Sermon on the Mount, and now he is defining two important realities for those who choose to follow him. These two realities are discipleship and good works both of which lead us into the very mission of the kingdom of God. So so Jesus begins talking to us about what discipleship actually is. As we saw last week, people who choose to live Jesus' way will often find themselves mistreated. We talked about that. The the negative consequences of, of being reviled and persecuted and accused falsely, they don't sit well with us today. We don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to be mistreated. We want people to like us. And yet Jesus says, if you follow me, people will not like you. But here Jesus takes and he flips the script on us a little bit. He, he moves away from that negative connotation and moves more into this positive aspect of a disciple's role in the mission of the world. He, he takes one of the most expensive daily necessities and he tells his disciples, this is what you are. You are the salt of the earth a common household ingredient that is absolutely vital in the life of every single person who is listening to Jesus' voice. Now, salt in the first century, it was used to season bland food, just like it is today. But salt was much more than just seasoning that you kept on a table. Salt was also used as a purifying agent. It would be used as a preservative so you could preserve food for long periods of time. But it was also used in other places. Salt was also used at the temple in sacrifices. It was used as a means of purification. And so you had a lot of different uses of salt if you were a Jewish person in the first century. And so it's with all of those functions in mind that Jesus tells his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. Essentially what he's saying is that his disciples, those who follow Jesus, they are to the earth what salt is to their culture. A disciple is the seasoning that makes things better around them. A disciple is a purifying agent that brings the purity of God into the world. A a disciple is someone who preserves life and holds life up for others to, to have. And a disciple is sacrificial. In other words, as the kingdom of God infiltrates into this world, y'all, the disciples are the needed ingredient that will be utilized to season the world as salt seasons food. But then Jesus, he asked his disciples, he asked these people listening to him, he asked them this question. It's a question that we cannot ignore. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? anyone think of a way? You see, the obvious answer is it can't. Saltiness cannot be restored to salt. And so essentially what Jesus is saying through this question is that that when salt loses its value as salt, it becomes worthless. You throw it out. And the same is true of a disciple. 
A disciple who ceases to function as a disciple has lost his or her value to the kingdom of God. You see, discipleship is, is an integral part of God's holy kingdom. And, and the scope of discipleship, it, it extends far beyond our personal interests. God doesn't care what you like or don't like to do. Because discipleship and mission, they're inseparable. We have to have one in order to have the other. The disciples flavor the mission. And a disciple becomes useless for a mission when he or she fails to take their role of discipleship seriously. And that is what Jesus says leads to judgment. Just as salt-free salt is thrown out and trampled underfoot, a disciple who fails to take their mission seriously will be treated the same. But then Jesus, he, he, he moves on to this next metaphor. We talk about light. He, he continues along with this same idea of, of salt, but then he again focuses in on the role of the discipleship, this case, light. The boundary of the disciples' mission, the entire boundary is, as John Wesley said, the world. The world is my parish, he said. It's like salt had a specific connotation for those first century Jewish men and women. Salt is light. Do you realize in Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Jesus, knowing his scriptures, he takes this and he applies it to himself. He, he takes this reading from Matthew and applies this light to himself. But there's another place in Isaiah, chapter 60, the prophet says something else. He says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and the, kingdom, the kings to the brightness of your dawn. So in this particular case, Isaiah, he, he's talking about the city of Jerusalem. He, he's saying that Jerusalem is this light. Since the days of Abraham's call out of the darkness, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation has been told that they are supposed to show the rest of the world what it looks like to have a relationship with God. And, and so Jesus, he takes this metaphor of light. He takes all of this Old Testament illusion, all of this light imagery, imagery that the Jewish people understood, and he applies it once again to his disciples. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. That's Jerusalem. If you ever go to Israel, Jerusalem, you always go up to Jerusalem because it's on top of a hill. Jerusalem in Isaiah 60 is that city. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, refers to Isaiah 9, where light is shined out into the darkness so that other people can see it. Jesus takes these powerful Jewish images and he applies them to his disciples. He's applying them to us, y'all. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. It hit me this week. I, I've read this scripture I don't know how many times. But it hit me this week of what he's saying. So that they may see your good works. And that's where it is. Just as Jesus' own life and his teaching, it bore witness to God's redemptive activity to those who had eyes to see and ears to hear, the disciples' good works will lead others to recognize the presence of God's transforming power right here in this world today. Our discipleship, yours and mine, is the witness to God's salvation. It is our good works that are seen in the darkness of the world. And, and those good works, they, they lead others to also glorify God and to acknowledge that God is God. It is what draws other people to have, have a relationship with Him too. We need to understand this, church. We need to understand that our discipleship is directly tied to our mission. You can't separate them one from the other. And it pains me to say this, 
but it's a true statement. Many Christians and a lot of churches, they've done just that. They've separated the mission from the person. They, they separated God's mission from discipleship. They've removed the salt from the earth, and they have chosen to hide the, light, the lamp under the basket. And Jesus is saying you can't do that. Because discipleship isn't just our word. It's not just what we say we believe. It's what we do. It's our deed. There's no dichotomy between what we do and what we say. As we are proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ through our words by being salt, we are also required to bear witness to that verbal expression to those living out in the darkness by doing good deeds, by shining the light into the world. Or as we say in Muleshoe, if you're going to talk the talk, then you best be walking the walk. But you see, there's a warning that must be heard if we choose to walk our talk. Because you see, when we choose to live a full life of discipleship, one of two things is going to happen. And I know this for a fact. On the one hand, others will hear our testimony. They'll hear what we say. They will see our good works, and they will be drawn into the faith. They will see that our transformed lives bear witness to the truth of the Christian faith. Even as our mission makes the our mission here, it makes lives better for others that we encounter. Our words of faith bolster their desire to be transformed. It works together. Jesus' own ministry to the poor and to the sick, to his, all of his teaching and preaching, all of the stuff he did worked together to show us what the model looks like. This is how you do ministry. But on the other hand, if we choose to be honest to goodness followers, disciples of Jesus Christ, our discipleship will cause the very persecution noted in the Beatitudes. It's guaranteed to happen. When Jesus attacked the injustices of his day, and when he challenged the power establishment of the Herods and of the empire, when he championed the disenfranchised, he paid the consequences. I'm sure you remember that story. He was falsely accused, he was then beaten, and then he was crucified. And so our own discipleship, which includes the mission that we have been called to, if our discipleship lacks suffering, then it is hardly worthy of the name of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Our salt has lost its saltiness. Our light is hidden under a bushel basket. You see, discipleship means living our life in relationship to God and to others so that God's life-changing transformation becomes evident in the world around us. Discipleship means following in Jesus' own footsteps of doing good deeds, not for our glory, but for the glory of God. Amen. Raise your hand if you know the mission statement at Aldersgate Methodist Church. Good, there's four of us. Okay. Our mission at Aldersgate is raising up deeply devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. There it is, disciples. And so our discipleship must follow what Jesus teaches here. Our discipleship means not just saying what we believe, not just reciting the Apostles' Creed on a Sunday morning, but living out that belief into the world around us every single day of the week. The life of a disciple often leads to rejection and persecution. We're going to have to be okay with that. Because Jesus says it leads to the fate of the prophets of the Old Testament. They killed him, y'all. It leads to the fate of Jesus the Messiah. That's discipleship. So both of these elements, salt and light, they're inherent to Christian ministry and to mission. And the negative, the negative results are laid out in the Beatitudes. They're crystal clear. Jesus does not hide any of this he tells us up front in this greatest sermon ever told. 
And yet those results do not diminish the imperative of the disciples' role to be salt of the earth and light of the world. To become one of the people of God is to become a part of God's redemptive plan for the entire creation, for the entire cosmos. The nature of these implications, we're going to be looking at them over the next several weeks as we dig into our relationships with one another and how those relationships affect our relationship with God. But as we look at these relationships, church, our focus will remain on the disciples' life as we live life in front of other people, as we live life in front of God. And that life illuminates those who are sitting in the great darkness. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may the grace and peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.